Andy, welcome to the Roadman Podcast. Hi, Anthony. Good to be on here. I've been looking forward to this one for a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really uh, enjoyed the uh, Le Mans Part One, and uh, yeah, really looking forward to chatting. I was thinking about story arcs, and you're you're a great storyteller, a really gifted storyteller in that kind of Venn diagram of people who can tell a story and people with cool stories to tell. Like I think you're right in the center. You have a cool story to tell, and you can tell it super well. And I was thinking about storytelling in general as the story arc. I mean, like Superman's such a great story, but Superman's scared of kryptonite and, you know, it brings him to his knees. Superman without the kryptonite's not a very good story. It's just a dude, it's basically Pogacha. It's a dude who can win everything he touches. It's not a very good story arc. But that's not what Tom Simpson is. Tom Simpson is a very human character. He's very flawed. I wonder, is that why we all have such a connection to him? Because we see a little bit of ourselves in him. I think there's a lot of reasons why. Um, You know, firstly, I'm British. I've grown up in a British cycling community where, obviously, I I wasn't alive when Tom Simpson was, but you're, you're told, you learn when you get into the sport of pro cycling that Tom Simpson was the first, first, you know, great modern British road racer. He was a pioneer. He was the one who who won these first classics. He he won San Remo. He won Flanders. Bordeaux Perry, the world champs, wore the Tour de France, you know, yellow jersey at, at a time when, you know, just crossing the English Channel to the extremely Eurocentric sport of cycling as, as it was then was a huge chasm. Like it was so different. There was there was no road racing tradition really in the UK. Like e- even racing on the roads was a revolutionary controversial thing in in the 1950s so there's that connection there you know there's that my connection already from older people who are still alive who you know there's a a tom simpson appreciation society on facebook and there's (laughs) there's still stories there's new photos there's new stories there's new fans like who are joining it but it it's kept alive you know his daughter's very prolific on there and it's a really nice thing because they're, re- they're reliving a great sporting champion um, and it feels like he's still alive because you are getting these new standpoints. But then you have the continental angle. Right? They connect because he came over to Belgium and he lived in Ghent for a long time. You know, He lived in, in Brittany for a little bit um, and they grew to love him because he was a character and because he was a fantastic road racer too, regardless of his nationality. That they kind of played that up. So uh, there's lots of reasons I think, why. I, I think it's kind of wild how tribal we are because much in the same way that the French use an expression, I'm not sure if you, how much time you spent out there, le métier, it's like the, the sacrifice, the hard work, the dedication. And as a part of that, I always talk when I raced in France, it's understanding that cycling culture and your cycling heritage. And by understanding that, we can make you know better tactical decisions, training decisions into the future. But you know, myself and yourself are only a couple of hundred miles apart separated by the RC, yet your cultural traditions around Tom Simpson and our cultural traditions around like Shay Elliott, they're so, so different. Why do you think it's so important that we keep these stories alive, that the new generation coming through understands how prolific writers like this were? Yeah, yeah. I think it's really interesting that, you know, I'm into lots of different sports, you know, football, tennis, uh, boxing, athletics, but cycling is maybe the one that has the closest connection back through time. This It's more than nostalgia. Like it's something you can feel. It's tangible. Um, and maybe that's because what we call the monuments, yeah, it's a fairly recent phrase, but those top races, firstly, they've not really changed in terms of prestige for, I don't know, 80 years, uh, 70 years, like, you know, Tor, Giro, Vuelta, five monuments. Um, so that's really, that is like the chain through time that doesn't break. Um, so Merckx, who wins, you know, Tor Flanders in 1969 compared to like Pogaccio winning it, you know, there is a comparison there. Like yeah. even the route, some of the roads were kind of similar. But then, you know, bikes change, kit changes, blah, blah, blah. They're still doing, you know, it's the, uh, it's the same exhausting, demanding pursuit of, you know, sacrifice that it always has been, maybe even more, you know, with sports science and nutrition and all the rest of it. But even that hasn't changed that much. So that's what I really like, that 
I was actually talking to Vin Denson, who was Tom Simpson's teammate uh, in the 60s. I was talking to him a few months ago. And firstly, he's a great storyteller. But secondly, he can he still watches cycling. He still respects what they do. He's still being guest of honor at, at the Tour of Britain. So it's kind of like we respect the forefathers and yeah. the foremothers. That's not really a word, but uh, foremothers <laughs> who have been before <laughs> us. And they respect, you know, we hear Merck's talking about Pogaccio. They respect the new breed too. That's really nice. There's that, I suppose respect is a word. That even as fans, we have that. We compare, can't really compare that copy to Pogaccio. And you have to be really old to still be alive to remember both of them. But there is a point of kind of comparison and respect is what I'm really, that's a word that links everyone through time. How do you approach as a storyteller a story like Tom Simpson's that has equal measures, triumph and tragedy? Is that a challenge? Yeah, it's it, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, also because, you know, when I was pitching Bird on the Wire nearly 10 years ago, um, there were there were already a few books out there like about Tom Simpson. So firstly, you don't want to go over, you want to go over, you know, you can't change the achievements. You want to focus on them, but you don't want to, I didn't want to kill him with my words. He's already dead. He died 50 years ago. There's no point um, attacking him, you know. Um, so I wanted to find new angles and you wanted to mix that. I mean, there is that triumph. And I thought with Bird on the Wire, writing it, I actually thought a lot of his achievements hadn't been focused on in like, enough depth, you know. For a lot of people, even in the, in the UK, let alone on the continent, especially France, you know, because he died on Mont Ventoux in the 67 Tour of France. He is known as, you know, the first big name cyclist to die related to doping. And that has been like, that is his story for many people. But that's, that is just one part of the story, like, and it's kind of un unfair. And that's kind of covered everything for 50 years. So I kind of wanted to bring it back to, well, hang on, like, he was a trailblazer. He raced with great panache, great charisma, and he did so many new things and people loved him you know rivals loved him let alone teammates friends family like he was larger than life so so I, I wanted to tell that life not just like the cycling life like there's a few chapters where I talk about you know Porto Paris him winning Il Lombardia but also you know driving at 100 miles an hour on mountain roads with his wife screaming at him to stop and then she'll like divorce him you know if he doesn't slow down and you know the jokes he would pull so you get both sides you know or well, all the sides the father the racing cyclist uh the champion the human being i've been debating this in another context i've been reading a totally off the wall book about german philosophy and one of the philosophers in the book, it was a card-carrying Nazi during the Second World War. And so then even before you get into any of his philosophical teachings, I suppose it poses this implicit question, is everything that he says in a philosophical sense tainted by the fact that he was a card-carrying Nazi? So to throw that one back to you, is Tom Simpson as a legacy separable from Tom Simpson's legacy and his involvement in doping? Um, so when you first started that question, I, I, I was racking my brain thinking, was Tom Simpson like a Nazi? Like, I, I was trying <laughs> to think of the link. I was like, no, he was too young for that. <laughs> I, I was like, did I miss something huge in the research? I, I, I mean, there's probably a book in that, you know. Uh, He's a double agent. <laughs> double agent. Hey, fool me. <laughs> fool lots of journalists. Well, <laughs> well, there's great stories about Bartolet. I'm not sure if you've read Road to Valor, Bartolet carrying the documents, the forged documents to get Jews out of Italy. But that's a story for another day. It is a story for another day. I, I don't want to be that guy, but I've heard some, I've read some revisionist things saying that it's not quite how it appears, but that really don't is that another... Guy. Don't be that guy. I'm don't not that guy. Santa's we won't go real. there. <laughs> we won't go there today. But to answer your question, absolutely it's separable. Um, also... It was a very different time, like, and it isn't condoning what happened, but there weren't anti-doping tests in the Tour de France till I think it was 65, you know, maybe 1960 was the first one. You know, doping as a thing that we know it now is one of the scourges of modern sport was not on the radar. And 
past champions were doping pretty freely. We know that, you know. But Fausto it's bizarre Coppi. that it wasn't on the radar, isn't it, Andy? Because I, my master's is actually in doping in sport from a legal perspective. And as a very small part of that, I trace the origins of doping. And like it goes back to the gladiators used to dope in the Colosseum when they were fighting each other. Like this has been around since time has been around. Hey, road man, excuse the short interruption. I love riding the bike, but on account of being so busy with the podcast at the moment, I'm now what's called a time crunched rider. I never thought I'd see the day. But I have a tool. I'm using what bike to keep myself sharp and on point with specific sessions to maximize that available training time. I have a what bike Adam right here in the recording studio beside me. And when I have an hour in between interviews, I jump on. It's removing all the friction points for me. There's no more 10 minute setup, unfolding legs, banging my knees off stuff, getting my hands dirty, the usual connection issues. It just works every single time. The Adam's perfect for virtual racing as well because it has crisp gear changes. It has 1% accuracy and it has max gradient capability of up to 25%. If you're looking for an indoor trainer, I honestly couldn't recommend this any higher. I've been using a Watt bike since 2013. Honestly, it's the last indoor trainer that you're ever going to need. If you head on over to wattbike.com now and use code ROADMAN10, that's R-O-A-D-M-E-N-T-E-N, and that's going to get you 10% off your Watt bike. That's really interesting. Like I actually went down a kind of rabbit hole researching, I think it was for the Tom Simpson book, let alone... So I, I don't want on Frank Vandenbroek too, but um, reading all around the origins, especially for Simpson, like I, I think we'd just come out, it's timing too, we'd come out of, of, of World War II where I think it's true to say that, you know, uh, Nazis um, and the Allies and the Americans and maybe the Japanese, you know, in the war were all using some kind of um, performance and enhancers to keep them alert or keep them awake or make them even... Uh, kind of give them false energy, like um, um, like uppers and like downers stimulants. Yeah. I can't quite remember what they all were now, but there's it. So there's, a, so there's that culture, but there's not that stigma. Like I remember Anthony Eden, who was a British prime minister, was using stimulants to keep him like alert. Like when the prime minister's doing it, <laughs> you kind of think it Wasn't can feel. Wasn't there a story that Sean Kelly's mechanic was doping at one point as well. Sean Kelly was working his mechanic so hard that his mechanic was having to take like Belgian party mix or something or equivalent to get to the races. Poor Belge, yeah. Well, I, I mean, there's all these stories, but like there wasn't that stigma. Um, it's really, it is a bizarre to think now, but it's also, and I also think the way that we look at doping changes depending on the country where you're in. Like this is kind of a, this is a broad generalization, but I find that sometimes Spanish and Italian riders get off a little bit easier from their public, from their media than say British and like Dutch and more traditionally 100%. puritanical, yeah. you know, countries. Uh, because I think there's this attitude in the UK sometimes where we're like, oh, this, this couldn't happen in our country. You know, British sports people wouldn't do. And then when it happens repeatedly, I mean, with many athletes over the years, Dwayne Chambers, um, there's this inflated sense of kind of shock, but we should, you know, remove nationality from sport sometimes that, that any person from any country in any sport can she, and it, it doesn't matter how nice they are, how charismatic, how boring or unpleasant they are. You know, that's just how it is. But that's a great point, because if you think about Wiggins and Froome, to my knowledge, have never tested positive for anything. But yet their legacy, it's weird using the word legacy for Freon when he's still racing, but is he still racing? <laughs> so he's there, has a jersey on. But the legacy of those two guys seems so tainted by inhalers, the chiffy bags, all that stuff that went on at Sky. And I think if you ask someone on the street who's not super into cycling, they would maybe reference that, even though neither of the guys ever tested positive. And I think they have five Tour de France wins between them. And then you look at Valverde, who did dope, was convicted of doping, came back and was welcomed basically back as a hero. Yeah, um, Ivan Basso, who I, I think I, I actually kind of confessed more than most do. And I think, if I'm right to recall, he helped out with information a little bit. I just saw him at the weekend at, at Strade Bianchi. Uh, he's in a team manager role, you know, which is fine. You know, he served his time. But there isn't that kind of... So I, I don't think that Bradley Wiggins always 
or like Chris Froome have been blacklisted or have a dark cloud, particularly over their names. Um, but there is that that smoke, you know, no smoke kind of without fire, certainly with Wiggins and the Triumph Sin alone and the Jiffy Bag. Um, I also think it, it, it's partly down to the way Team Sky won and raced that filters into it, you know. Pogacar, for comparison's sake, races in such an expressive uh, and open way and just wants to ride a band kit with an 80k insane solo, whereas we know how Team Sky raced. It was kind of like a lead out up a mountain with with the kind of, what's the word, stereotype that they were staring at their stems, looking at their power meters, yeah. when in truth, it isn't as easy as that. Like, And that didn't help, that stereotype, in terms of the popularity of Freeman and Wiggins and how they're perceived now. When you think about how much we've changed societally in the last, you know, 10, 15 years, never mind going back to when Tom Simpson made that jump from the UK across to France. Like we don't have, we didn't have the internet to pop a team a message and say, hey, can I come over and ride for you next season? We didn't have Google Maps to plan the journey, you know, Skyscanner to plan the flights. Like Greg LeMond spoke to me on the podcast about one of his first experiences going to Europe and he flew out to Europe. He had basically no money. I think he'd like $18 or something in his pocket, got to the airport. Someone was meant to pick him up. There's no one there. All he had was an address of a village, not a house, a village on a piece of paper. He assumed someone was going to pick him up. No one picked him up. He asked the taxi driver, like, how much to get to this village? Taxi driver was like $40 equivalent. And he's like, I only have 18. Eventually, the taxi driver, who was from Hagelin, agreed to take all his money to drop him to this village. And he didn't know who he was looking for. So he had to start knocking door to door to see if anyone knew about cycling or a cycling team. And eventually he got pointed in the right direction and brought into a house. And that was the start of his racing in Europe. And that's 80s. So rewind that 20 plus years to when Tom Simpson's getting started. How hard was that transition from racing in the UK to making it to France? Or did you uncover documentation or stories about that era? Absolutely. Like it was even harder than it was for kind of Greg LeMond. Like, yeah, like the kids these days don't know how good they have it and, you know, how, how easy. <laughs> We're like two boomers, aren't we talking about? You don't know how good you have it, lads. To be fair, like uh, I think two summers ago, I went uh, on a camping trip like with my girlfriend and we agreed we wouldn't take any, um, any technology, no phones, no screens, no laptop. So I memorized the route. Uh, like camping, it was about like an hour and a half drive and you had to go through London. And I really planned it out. And you don't even know what time it is when you wake up. So we might have bought an <laughs> alarm clock. And we didn't get lost, but I put this down more to luck than, uh, you know, planning. Uh, but it, firstly, it was really nice to be away from screens for, you know, two, three days. But secondly, yeah, you just take it for granted that, you know, we look at our phones I think I was reading like seven hours, like a day on average or something in America. Brilliant. And like, but anyway, sorry to answer your question, gone off on tangent there to boast about my navigation <laughs> skills. Um, yeah, like it was, Simpson did a lot of track racing. He rode the Commonwealth Games, I think in Australia when he was just up, up and coming. And already the desire was there. Like you could kind of, you could even see it in the way that he raced. Um, it was kind of, yeah, almost visible that he was strong sometimes too strong, and he burnt himself out by um, attacking too early or, you know, racing technically too hard, you know, crashing on certain corners. But he had something. And I think the only magazine they had here in, in the UK was a monthly called Cura, um, and run by Jock Wadley, who was a legendary British uh, fighting journalist. So he'd been seeing that, and he knew the only way to make it on the continent in this alien sport, like Brittany, France, Belgium, Italy, Spain, you know, the heartland of cycling that might as well have been Mars. It was that distant. Like he knew that he had to go there. So he got the boat over to Brittany. And like you say with Greg Lamond, like you just wind up, I think he had a connection. You wind up in this village. You don't speak French. You probably have a few francs, but really not many pennies to put together. Um, actually, I'm just recalling, I think he, he borderline dodged military service to oh, go really? to Brittany. He kind of popped on the boat, yeah, to avoid getting you know caught up because it would have wrecked his, his dreams, yeah. his cycling career. 
which is interesting. Like, again, kind of beyond our comprehension, you know, conscription, I think it was 59, 1960, 15 years after World War II, but, you know, still it was that generation who was still just about recovering from it. So he popped over to Brittany and, you know, you're racing, you don't know anyone, you don't speak French, you're staying with some some Breton grandma, <laughs> you know, like, living off French bread. And there are combines, it's a mafia out there, you know, often then as it is sometimes now in, in commisses. And by mafia, I kind of mean you have to know the right people. You have to know the game. You have to know the riders that have been doing it for years. And, you know, this is their local town. They're going to win today or they're going to let you come third or win that prime, you know. And so gradually he made a, he made a bit of money, but also it was really about getting noticed by anyone, you know. And he was racing in some pro-am races and that's where he kind of caught the attention of a, of a bigger team and his his career in Europe could really take off from there. One of my understandings of him is that he was like quite an early showman, that he appreciated the value of spectacle. I don't know if that was inbuilt just into his racing style. As you say, he was quite punchy and energetic, especially in the short races, or if this is something he you know, almost purposefully curated in the sense that we see, you know, modern athletes like Conor McGregor or half athlete, half showman. Did you get a feeling for if that was his personality or if that was more uh, kind of, yeah, like I say, curated or thought about? That's a good question. Like, I, I, And I, I think we should think about this for modern sports people too, that you know, how much is kind of their real self? And how much is a little bit of exaggeration to look at in front of the camera, to, you know, to potentially get even more fans or more like endorsements by being more charismatic. But certainly Tom Simpson, that was mainly him with a little bit of uh, exaggeration or curation um, because he knew that basically being the lone Brit, he wasn't the lone Brit. Uh, Brian Robinson was the first British cyclist to really make it as a fixture on the continent um the late brian robinson who i've had the pleasure of interviewing several times um he was following him firstly so like robinson told me stories of tom simpson he would be working for him and he'd be like get on my wheel come on follow me and then he'd turn around and he'd fallen off on a on a corner <laughs> um but these are all things that tom, uh, simpson could also use to his advantage i right? he knew that he had to play up this Britishness. So at a certain point, he started going around with a with a, the bowler hat and an um, umbrella like the British gentleman because that was a stereotype of, of Brits for, for the French back in the 60s. It's where Chris Eubank got it from, was it? <laughs> Maybe, yeah. It seems to work for him okay. <laughs> like, and it seems a little bit bizarre now, but it, it was this urbane gentleman. Tom Simpson, you know, was perfectly well-educated, but he wasn't, you know, like an upper class figure from London, as a stereotype might have it. He was from the kind of, kind of Nottinghamshire, Yorkshire border. He lived in a mining town. That's also what he was getting away from, you know, from, from a likely livelihood of working down the pit. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, kind of curated. But he would always give quotes to journalists and they started calling him Mr. Tom or Major Tom um, by this kind of like inflated larger than life army general. And that was also the, like, the way that he raced, you know. It wasn't like today. I, they didn't wait till the Poggio or the final climb. You know, 15K, I had to go to light it up. You could go on all-day breakaways and sometimes win the stage or even win the stage race. Like, it, it was less calculated and kind of more endearing and homespun. You only get away with that sort of swagger wearing top hats. Like, if you're wearing a top hat and you're coming in the Gruppetto, it just doesn't work. That incongruity just doesn't sit well with the fans. Like, he did have a decent Palmares. We shouldn't forget that. Like, the Worlds in 65, Flanders in 61, the uh, San Remo, year escapes me. I think there was a Lombardy in there too, obviously yellow in the tour. Was there a breakthrough ride there where, you know, you don't fluke a race at that level? Was there a precursor to those results that said, oh yeah, like, Tom could win the biggest races in the world? Or was there an indication that that sort of talent was there? 
I would say him winning Flanders in 61 was a surprise, like already. But I, I think 1960 Paris-Roubaix, he'd been up the road. And he didn't, I think he tapped about 50k to go. Um, and it looked like he was going to win. Um, and he'd just been pro, not yet. He'd not even been pro for a whole year. You know. Pro. 50k to go on Roubaix is a fucking ambitious raid, Gilbert esque. The thing is, like, Paris Roubaix was quite different then. Like, in the 60s, they were really struggling to find cobbled sectors. Um, there were much fewer cobbled sectors. I, I think uh, until very recently, the average speed record for Roubaix came from an, a race in the 60s because there were so few cobbled sectors. So, that was a year that Roubaix almost lost um, everything. You know, it lost what makes it. It almost lost what makes it special now. Uh, but they uh, they worked to find new sectors, like the like the Arenberg Forest, only came out I think at the end of the sixties, like other ones. And that's a modern Roubaix we know now from the seventies onwards. But this, don't get me wrong, had had cobbles, um, and you know, st- still had miners, you know, who would be up from their shift. On a Sunday, you know, watching these these road races come by, and then you see Tom Simpson, like, and yeah, in my book, there's some great photographs uh, that we dug out from God knows where of him in the breakaway going through these these northern French towns, and he he ran out of gas, he didn't quite make it, but he'd shown himself, he'd shown shown that he could do it. He also won a race called the Tour de Sud-Est. I think it was the year before that, uh, which had a fair few climbs. That's tour of the, of the southeast. I don't know if they went up Montferron. So those were the early things that showed that he deserved his contract with with Saint Raphael, which is which was that team was the inspiration for the brand Rafa that we know it as. And you know, being the good old days, they were an aperitif brand. They were alcohol. <laughs> they were so whenever he was up the road, it was good advertising for you know what everyone would be drinking at. 5 p.m. on the French Riviera. <laughs> you, you talked about him running out of gas in Roubaix. You know, that's an expression club cyclists will use all the time or run out of gas. Now, in the pro ranks, we've moved to this, you know, high octane carbohydrate fuel of 120, 140, 150 grams of carbohydrates per hour. Do you have insight into what fueling was like for those sort of lads? Is it a case that he actually did run out of gas? He's just glycogen depleted because of pure fueling? Or is it, you know, I'm just done for the day, I'm cooked? What can I swear on this podcast? Swear away. <laughs> Basic as fuck. Like, like, yeah, the nutrition was... Tell you, I'll tell you, Tour de France, like, for example, I believe that the riders, all the riders on the race were assigned, you know, dormitories and really average hotels, but they also had a feedback given by the race. Like, kind of like a mansion at packed lunch assigned to you, you know, by yeah. school. And if you didn't like the moldy peaches that would be in there, too bad. Like if you, if you didn't like the bit of bread or the cheese or whatever they had, too bad, you know. So we were a long way from energy gels, energy bars. So nutrition was centrally provided by the race organizer rather than the team? Or was that bad coming from the team? My Woosh is hands down the best virtual cycling app for home and it's redefining indoor training at no cost. Yep, it's absolutely free. And setting up My Woosh is really easy. Just download the My Woosh app, connect your device like your Watt bike or your smart trainer and off you go. Now, if you're feeling competitive, there's weekly races for every category from beginner to pro, Plus, there's insane prize money up for grabs. Now, if you've no plan to race, that's no problem. There's hundreds of free training plans and workouts that are designed to really push you to your limits. You can enjoy daily group rides and group workouts, and you can customize your avatar all without opening your wallet. So go on over to the MyWish app and have a look around. Why spend money on monthly subscriptions elsewhere when MyWish offers all of this for free? So join MyWish today. It's available on iOS, Mac OS, Google Play, Apple TV, or click on the link in the show notes to get started. That was a Tour de France. Like, I'm not sure like, about some other races, but I also know that in terms of refueling, they would often stop at you know, bars and Grand Tours on the side of the road. And they would, you know, they would put beers in their pocket. You'd have domestiques, you know, go back, fit as many cold bottles 
in their pockets, like down their backs. And the race organizer will pay the bill later, which sounds ridiculous. But they probably didn't do that, but anyway. Um, and they have to go back through the caravan. You know, they were minutes behind. And they'd have, you know, Jacques Coutil would have his, sa- his favorite, you know, bit of wine, or maybe they fancy the kind of cold beer. Um, and he would shout at domestique sometimes if they didn't have a bottle opener or it was a wrong, <laughs> wrong kind of wine, you know, like, <laughs> which, which is incomprehensible. Tom Simpson, I think he even had a, on that fateful day that he died before going up Mont Ventoux in the Tour de France 67, it was a, a sweltering day, so hot and airless. Um, and I think he even had a nip of, it might have been brandy. I, I can't remember the spirit, but he had that to kind of fortify himself for, for what's to come, which is kind of sad in a way, because that may have con- contributed to, to his death, considering what was in his system in terms of, of drugs. Uh, kind of sad that it was such basic nutrition. Like It probably wasn't helping them. It was hurting them, dehydrating them, uh, not giving them energy, you know. It's so dangerous and irresponsible looking back. Do we know what happened on, as you say, on that fateful day? Because Tom Simpson on Mont Ventoux, it's one of the pivotal moments in cycling history. Has there been, was there autopsies? Was there investigations into the death? Is there a consensus now as to what actually happened? Um, the caveat is it, it's been a few years since I finished writing the book, so I can't recall every detail of this. Um, but I know the, uh, that morning Simpson was, I think he was on the edge. He was just inside the top 10 of the tour and he was really racing for his future. Like he wanted to win the Tour de France, but to be completely honest, he probably never had it quite within him to do that. He was a great one day racer. He was a really good climber, but he wasn't you know, the best. So he was overreaching anyway, you could say with, with hindsight. Um, he wasn't bad, but he wasn't number one. Um, so he was pushing himself. I think he'd already been ill a few days earlier in, in the race. And, and yeah, you had this pivotal stage up finishing up. I, I think it was, was it finishing on one, two, or was it going down on the other side? Not sure. But anyway, yeah, I'm not sure. Big climb, huge, one of the toughest in the Tour de France, as we know. Um, and yeah, he wasn't having the best day. He took some water from Finn, from Finn Denson, his teammate, you know, at the foot of the climb. And Vin shouted at him, die, die, which means, come on, go for it in Italian. Um, and years later, decades later, Denson feels bad about that because of what eventually happened. You know, he, he did die, you know, in English. Um, basically, basically, Simpson got further and further up the climb and he dropped behind the leaders and he was weaving on his bike. Um, I, I think um, he got to within, tragically, about 1,500 meters from the summit, so close. And he killed over a few times. And, you know, the, the mechanics in the car behind him, they, they tried to put him back on the bike. Obviously, he was in toe clips. So sometimes he was just falling into the road, you know, these one all kind of two times. And that final time with, with 1.5k to go, yeah, he was basically like delirious, like unconscious. And, and that's when they realized, you know, they had a problem and, uh, and a helicopter was called, you know, landed on the scree of this lunascape that is Mont Ventoux. And they took him to the nearest hospital and they couldn't save him, sadly. Um, but also that's where I believe the race doctor, or one of the doctors found, found a box of um, amphetamines in his jersey pocket. I can't recall whether there was an autopsy done. Um, the family may not have wanted it, but I might be confusing it with my other book, Frank Vandenbroek. But anyway, like uh, the important thing is how it was reported by the media, because that has guided us, you know, for the years and years afterwards. And broadly speaking, that is that it that it was a doping related death. Uh, we know that because of the stereotype, the stigma attached to Tom Simpson, um, and this was. This was like from this is such big news. It's hard to convey. Like this was a JFK moon landing moment. You know, millions of people in France were listening to the radio when this happened. They were following it like that. Like 
The Airbnb host who I had at the weekend, who's French, told me he remembered Tom Simpson. He remembered that moment. Like, it sticks in their memory, this sporting tragedy, you know, because Tour de France athletes now, as then, are super, superheroes. They're not meant to, to pass out, let alone die. No, like, everyone should come home from every sporting event, from every bike race. So it truly was a tragedy for him to, be, to die in his prime. How do you think his legacy has influenced the sport of cycling? Good question. Um, there were lots of things he he wanted to do. You know, he liked the idea of kind of running a like a team, like a GB academy, thirty years before it actually happened. So he could, you know, give the education to young up and comers that he never had. He didn't have that privilege, which you know is a lovely like idea of this old older charismatic Tom Simpson like with his arm out the window of the car, you know, giving advice to, to the future generation. That could have been his legacy. Um, his legacy was a uh, slight tightening up of anti-doping controls in the Tour de France because everyone realized, the organizers too, that something was amiss here. That There was a kind of pretty endemic use of stimulants in cycling at that time, and they needed to crack down on it. And um, unfortunately, it, it didn't really crack down. It didn't really stop. You know, it had the effect of riders feeling harassed, you know, refusing sometimes to do, to do anti-doping tests uh, and for it to go underground to become more secretive. And the tests were pretty, pretty rudimentary and pretty rare back then. Like, it's not like modern anti-doping. But even now, you know, the budgets of anti-doping federations compared to some sports, some sporting teams, who might, who might have so much more to gain, their budget is, is so small that they might always be behind the cheaters. Yeah. I often wonder if you, you transpose a, a rider from that era into the modern era, like how would they stack up? And you hear this debate all the time in every pub, you know, oh, if Pele was playing for Manchester United now, how many goals a season he would get? And that's, you know, an impossibility to figure out a question like if Pele was playing for Manchester United. But I spoke with the author of Beryl Burton's book that came out last year, and they actually tried to answer the question of how good Beryl Burton would be if she raced right now. So they got her old bike. They even had, a, I think, a 3D printed mannequin. Oh, no, they got a girl with her exact same dimensions, put her on the bike in the exact same kit, put her into the wind tunnel, and they tried to estimate the difference in power between Beryl Burton uh, then if you put her onto modern equipment, so if you put Beryl Burton onto, you know, your latest specialized SL8 aero optimized, like a middle of the road pro, how fast would she be? And they actually tried to answer that question. Where do you th think Tom Simpson would stack up? That's fantastic. Like that is a, as probably as close as you can scientifically come on nowadays to actually comparing, you know, apples to oranges, which is yeah. comparing, you know, copy to Merck's to, Indurain to Pogaccia. Um, that's brilliant. And it's more measurable for her maybe because she did so many time trials. Um, yeah. Tom Simpson, how would he stack up? You know, up against Van der Poel, Pogaccia. I think he'd be, he'd be up there. He would be more, probably more charismatic than the vast majority of, of the modern peloton. <laughs> and most of them were um, seemingly, you know. Also, they were more together as a, like, Jan Janssen, who's, might be the oldest living Tour de France winner, the Dutchman. He was telling me stories how, you know, it was war. It, it was brutal. They hated each other on the bike sometimes, but they would be drinking, drinking beers after the race and, you know, singing songs. And he loved Tom Simpson. Now, I'm, I'm not sure you'd get that camaraderie that you had because there was this, the Tour de France and every other big bike race was smaller. The world was smaller, the cycling world, and more insular. You don't get that nowadays. You know, people, uh, there's no social media back then. Like, there's no projection of a certain image and there's no, there were, no, there were some planes, you know, but only for the very best. Um, so everybody stuck up, Tom Simpson. I think he'd have a decent chance at winning a monument still. Um, like Il Lombardia. Cool. Yeah. Um, I think he, he was impetuous in his racing style then. Like, he would sometimes go too early. And that could be a problem. Uh, because he might not be strong enough to to always 
hold off your Vanderpols, your kind of Pogacias. It's kind of people, but I'm, I'm just trying to think about, because I remember writing the book and who did I kind of compare him to? Like in my mind, um, maybe someone a bit like Dan Martin, but yeah, someone really, really tough, um, consistent, likable. Um, God, I would, it is a great pub, pub debate. Like just imagining your fantasy cycling team through the decades, you know, how, how they compare. Um, Sometimes we we'll definitely have um, everyone laughing afterwards, <laughs> or even during the race. You know, he'd be a fan favorite. Maybe, maybe Jens Vogt meets Dan Martin. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. Yeah, if that makes sense. When someone finishes your book and they're speaking to me down the pub, they're down the pub, they're chatting with their mates, and they're like, "I just finished Andy's book about Tom Simpson. What enduring impression do you hope that book leaves on people?" I hope that it makes them see the totality of, you know, Tom Simpson, you know, the whole picture. So I think I said in the intro to the book that what happened on Mont Von Two, his death, of course, it's a huge part of his life, but it kind of grew over everything else, like ivy over a old house and obscured this beautiful old house. Uh, and there's so many nice rooms in this house and there's so many nice things. If, if you see my kind of labored um, comparison that we're really missing the rest of you know Tom Simpson in the mainstream um, and I was quite fortunate I, I was very lucky this book won this is my first book and it won the William Hill Sports Book of the Year prize which I never dreamed of happening but I like to think that that helped to get Tom Simpson's name and the book and his story out there much further because um, this is it, this was quite a small project with Rafa at the start of the time they were doing their books and it's, but it's a mix of photos and in uh, kind of in-depth storytelling. Um, and those photographs like cycling in, in life in 1960s, man, it, it's so much cooler than it is now. Like all the suits and the following cars, like you just free wish. Love. What's that? Free love. For, yeah. Free love. Are there like things were changing so much? Like when you look at the, of the decade Simpson was in, from the time he turned pro to his death, like went from like Gagarin going into space, the first man, to practically walking on the moon, you know, to the like, Vietnam War. We went from like almost World War II memories to like color TV. And I, I, I try to capture that too. Like it was a crazy decade. Also for cycling, because Simpson started out with Onkatil being the man, Onkatil Pulidor. And they were friends too, to Eddie Merckx coming along, being his teammate. And Tom Simpson did a number on him in, in Paris Nice 67. He won Paris Nice, Simpson. But he kind of put this young Belgian, this uh, cannibal to be in his place and kind of showed him, look, I'm the leader. You're going to work for me. And kind of worked <laughs> him over. Um, obviously, no one could keep Merckx down for long. I, I mean, know that he's the greatest, but um, yeah. Everything changed dramatically in that era. Andy, I've loved this conversation. Thanks for your diligent research and your time on illuminating one of the great historical figures in our sport. My pleasure. It's so much fun to talk about, you know, and explore other angles. And now I'm, I'm going to go away and really think about, you know, my fantasy cycling team, eight riders from uh, <laughs> cycling history. Who would you have? <sighs> oh, you know, obviously I'm going to have that Irish bias like, yeah, your your Roach obviously in eighty seven is, you know, borderline untouchable in cycling history. Kelly just you know, indomitable for almost a decade. So as the Irish bias, I definitely have to have the two of them in there. I think I, I would have Cavendish for the sprints for sure. Uh as my British bias. Um what else would I have? Boonan as just my my teenage teenage self speaking, but like Man, could he race and he looked good on the bike? And uh, are we talking was, doping bands or no doping bands? Can we put Armstrong as our GC man in there? Hey, there's no rules. Like, uh, <laughs> we, we, we set the rules, we set the rules. If it's fantasy, you know, it's fantasy. Um, if you want him in your team, go for it. Greg LeMond, I think we'd have to have him maybe in both our teams. So, you've got to manage that dynamic, though. Can you put Armstrong and LeMond in the same team? You've got to manage the dressing room. They're going to argue. There's 
there could be eight egos in this team. So you, you, you've got to pick carefully. Yeah, it's a minefield, isn't it? They could end up just bickering and coming ninth. Yeah, because I just can't see Lamond, Armstrong, Kelly, and Roach leading now Cavendish. It seems an improbable leader train. No, I, I can see uh, someone having a bid on thrown at them, like instead, you know, in anger. Like, um, <laughs> but it would be fun. Uh, but yeah, thank you. It, it's been a fantastic conversation. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much, Andy. So if you like this video, you should definitely check out this video because I know you're going to love it. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel.